I'd like to thank you all for coming. Um, we're going to start right off with, with John Burns. So uh, John founded John Burns Real Estate Consulting in 2001 to help business executives make the most informed housing industry investment decisions possible. His team of pals, passionate, articulate, likable, and smart people in offices all over the country advise the company's research subscribers and consulting clients on shifts in housing demand, supply, and affordability, as well as consumers, building products, and design trends. He has served on numerous industry boards, and more, more than 700,000 people follow his column on LinkedIn, and 23,000 subscribe to his free weekly emails. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to John Burns. I love that Noah's Ark slide. That was a good one. <laughs> um, all right, so I come from the new home industry primarily. Todd Tomalak's not with me. He covers the repair and remodeling, and I'm going to give you how, how we're seeing the, uh, the market. The best part of this presentation is going to be the Q&A, so if you haven't downloaded that Slido or, or, or app yet, uh, please do that, because that's what I'm going to learn. But I'm coming at this more from a data collection and a client feedback piece. Our clients look like this. Uh, we're growing the fastest in building products right now. Um, and I'm just trying to put all the puzzle pieces together to help you guys uh, forecast your business. So here's how we're getting there, and then I'll show you some of the data. So uh, we looked top down. We did a 9,000-hour research project that we wrote a demographics book on called Big Shifts Ahead. We're monitoring everything on the macro economy you can think of. We're in DC a lot, monitoring policy changes. We've got a bottoms-up approach. We're putting out a 70-page report on every metro area in the country every single month to help the builders know what's going on and allocate capital to every, every single market. We're surveying. 16% of all the new homes sold every month. Today, we're going to tell our clients exactly how uh, last month played out in the sales offices. Um, and then I'm also paying attention to what's hitting us from the left, all these innovations. The hottest thing that is going on in the industry right now is this new trend towards build for rent, which I'll present a little bit on that. Uh, and some of the disruptions with the iBuyers, clearly the offsite, which you guys know more than, than I do. And, and we put all our clients in a uh, room three times a year at a conference to hash all these things out. And then we're monitoring trends, too, with some of our products. So, so let's get to it. Uh, I'd like to start with a conclusion so then you can zone out. Um, but then I'll come back to it. And then hopefully you say, you know what, I agree or disagree with John. And if you disagree with me, that's going to be the best part of the Q&A. So I really encourage that. So the first thing is, hey, it's good today. The, the new home market is on very solid ground. And I know there's a lot of discussions about a recession. But you know what? A recession is not going to impact housing. We're not going to cause it. And it's not, it's, we're calling it a, a potential hiccup, not a housing downturn. The short term, and by that I mean the next three to six months, is looking really good. Uh, we got six months of very easy new home sales comps because the fourth quarter last year was a disaster. So you're going to see a lot of positive press. And I'm going to show you it has not, the, the sales that have picked up in the last few months have not shown up in the building product orders yet. I can almost guarantee they're going to show up in the next three or four months. And I'll, I'll walk that through, through that with you. Thinking over the medium term, the next few years, the industry is going to grow slowly. Uh, maybe it slows down a little bit if we have a recession. But I can tell you with almost 100% confidence there's no potential for a hockey stick recovery here. My clients do not have the land. They don't have the labor. They, they couldn't do it if you put a gun to their head and said, grow 15% a year for the next three years. But frankly, they cannot do it. Um, and they're, they're, they're managing their balance sheets cautiously, probably like you as well. But the long term, I've got a much more optimistic outlook, uh, actually probably less optimistic than some of the people that haven't done all the homework, but optimistic nonetheless. Uh, we think the policy and the trends are supporting about 100,000, maybe more, homes built per year once we can get there. Uh, price plays a role. If, they, if we could be building homes profitably at $200,000 a home, the builders would be building a lot more homes profitably, uh, but, but they can't. And we are going to see pricing power in the lower priced markets. Boston is not one of those. New York is not one of those. California is not one of those. But if you go to the south, uh, even though some of them have gotten quite frothy, I think there's pricing power there. So, so those are the four conclusions. 
Let me show you how I got there. So the new home market is on very solid ground. This is the one slide from the, the book we did. It's just a snapshot of the US population last year, color-coded by decade born. All the generational stuff compares 17 year periods to 19 year periods, and it's apples and oranges. This is 10 year periods to 10 year periods. You can see the purple there, born in the 1950s. There are 39 million of those. That shaded piece along the top means that uh, you live in America, but we're born in another country. And so the, the, the boom and the bust, the bust, which was those born in the 1970s, was very much filled in by immigration. You see the dip from the 1960s of 43 million people born in the 1960s, only dips to 41 million people born in the 1970s. So it's not as much as a boom and a bust as people think. At a high level, here are, uh, here's what's going on. If you call those born in the 1990s uh, renter demand, there's a 6% tailwind in renter demand. If you call those born in the 1980s entry-level buyer demand, that's where the entry-level buyers are coming from right now, there's an 11% tailwind there. I see some of you taking pictures. If you just want to send me an email, I'll, uh, I'll PDF it and, and send it back to you. It's jburns at realestateconsulting.com. Uh, move up demand, 7% fewer people. So it's not as much of a bust thanks to immigration, but still 7% fewer. And this has been the challenge for the home builders. Uh, they spent 20 to 30 years building move-up homes and McMansions and perfecting them with options and upgrades and the whole thing, and then all of a sudden, uh, the demographics shifted against them, and they've had to pivot down to some of these entry-level buyers or up to the retirees. 2% more people heading into empty nester years. I would be in that bracket. 34% more retirees, and I will come back to that. Those people already have a house, but it's a house that was designed for families, not for retirees, and that's the construction opportunity, is to get them out of a house that really doesn't fit their lifestyle into something that does. So solid demographic tailwinds. 10 years of economic growth. It's adults with an income that matters. You can see the blue line there. We've had 10 years in a row of 1.5 to 2% job growth, steady, steady, steady. At this point in the cycle, though, the job growth is not creating as much housing demand as usual because a lot of it is people are turning 65 and staying in the workforce. Usually there's a lot of people coming in and a lot of people dropping out. The, the, the dropout is still high, but not as much as you would think uh, through the demographics because people are working longer. This was a fun chart to put together. So we've had eight years in a row of 4% mortgage rates. If you're 30 years old, you don't know a 5% mortgage rate. I mean, think about that. And if you want to know why sales hit the skids last quarter, last year when rates got up to 4.9% because 4.9% was an unheard of high mortgage rate to a lot of people and everybody had refinanced at three and a half. So you have to pay a lot of attention to mortgage rates. And then despite all those positives, existing home sales revenue, if you take the, uh, the volume times the price, it's actually 1.6 trillion and trending down, flattish. New home revenue, $247 billion and about stable. Despite all these positive things going on, the industry is not growing. So here's what we're seeing around the market, and this is a subjective determination from all our consulting work and our, and our surveys, but this is our hotness index on whether or not the housing, home, homes are appreciating at the, basically the rate of inflation or the rate of cost increases and sa the sales paces are fine. Chicago has been red this entire cycle. Chicago has not recovered at all, and I'm talking about the Chicago metro area, not downtown Chicago. 26% of the top 50 or 13 markets, uh, things are slower than usual. Sales are slow, prices, we're actually seeing some price declines in some of these markets, and you can see they're concentrated in California and up in the Northeast, uh, where things tend to be expensive and where the Tax Act just uh, caused those people to take a bit of a hit as well. But then most of the country looks fine, and actually we're upgrading Phoenix to strong this month. Uh, two years ago, we had a lot of green on this chart. Things have just slowed down. And I wanna give you just a couple slides on the differences by geography, because this has been a very uneven recovery. This is the percentage of jobs compared to the prior peak before the Great Recession. Austin has 40% more jobs than it did 12 years ago. Can you imagine growing that fast? Nashville, 30%. Dallas, San Antonio, these have been the boom markets. 
Uh, no way supply could keep up with that level of demand, and you've seen a ton of price appreciation in these markets. You go down to California, Los Angeles, 7% more jobs. It's very, very different by geography. And we, we look at each geography and we roll them up to make these conclusions. We actually forecast each geography. Uh, let's look at equity in your house, home price appreciation. If you bought a home at the absolute worst time in 2006 in Denver, your home is appreciated 78%. <laughs> Everybody there has got a ton of home equity, tapping into remodels, I can buy a move up home, people are really feeling great. Go to Riverside or Las Vegas or Chicago, you bought a home at the worst time, you're still underwater. Very different market, and this in particular impacts the repair and remodeling business pretty significantly. So just wrapping up the geographies, this is the one slide I'll do it, where are we in the, in the housing cycle. There's uh, one market, Philadelphia suburbs, these are the major construction markets that we consider to be recovering. There's four that we consider to be in growth mode, Austin, Orlando, Phoenix, and Tampa. Most of the market, though, we've pushed into a, entering a maturing stage of the cycle, which shouldn't really surprise you uh, 10 years in. It actually took us a long time to get there because the recovery was so difficult. And we put five of them on a watch list for a downgrade because some of the fundamentals are starting to fall apart a little bit. Atlanta, Dallas, Denver, Las Vegas, and Minneapolis. Two markets where prices are actually declining. Six, where they're declining pretty substantially. And you can see a lot of California as well as Chicago and New York on that list and nothing really bottoming. So if you're running a national construction company, this is what's going on. It's a very different situation by geography. So let's talk about the short term, which I think looks good for sales starts and, and building products. So it's, when I really expanded heavily into building products about five years ago, it stunned me how focused everybody was on starts and not on sales. Because home sales determine how much inventory somebody has, uh, unsold or unsold. And then when that gets low, they decide to pull a permit. And you don't pay for a permit unless you're about to start a house. <laughs> And then the orders show up uh, later. So it's really a sales is the leading indicator you need to be paying attention to. And what stunned me the most is how removed this industry is from what's going on in the sales offices. So I would just encourage you to pay more attention to sales. So let me tell you what's going on that uh, hopefully I'll, I'll be right here. Uh, but the fourth quarter of 2018 was Armageddon. Sales slowed, inventory built up. If you're a builder and you have a whole bunch of homes under construction that aren't selling, you stop starting homes. Uh, that continued into early this year. But by the middle of this year, when interest rates came down from 4.9 all the way back down to 3.5, just a huge unexpected surprise, sales picked back up. Took a little while for the inventory to, to normalize, um, and you saw fewer orders while that was going on. But what we've seen the last few months, and I'll show you in a minute, is strong sales, low inventory, and um, two months ago we reported starts picked up for the first time in, in 13 months. So my forecast is the orders are going to show up. And let me show you two of our surveys. This is our survey of sales. This is home builders. These are the exact same home builders year over year. In September they sold 19% more homes per community than they did the prior year. You can see all that horrible red there in the fourth quarter. That's the easy comps we're now starting to, to, to comp over. Um, but sales have been strong. Our um, inventory grew during that fourth quarter. It's now starting to peter off. That green piece was actually they had paid for the permit and they hadn't started the home yet. So, um, But then what's happening in our lumber and building materials dealer survey? Flat. Now, there's, pri there's pricing issues in here, too, uh, but I'm pretty confident this is going to pick up uh, because of what I just showed you. So the short term looks pretty positive. The other thing I don't want you to be concerned about is the home builders themselves because they are recession ready and they're growing slowly. And ultimately, they are the ones who are going to be buying your products or making sure your products get purchased. So one of the analysis we did in our book concluded that we really only need, from a shelter standpoint, about 1.4 million homes built every year, which was much lower than everybody else's numbers. 
Uh, but we, we'd actually run the math on this, and there was some, we actually overbuilt the market a lot uh, in the late 90s and the early 2000s, and a lot of simple analysis, which draws a, a, a correlation to the averages, says, well, shoot, we should be at 1.7, 1.8 million. We can't get there from a demand standpoint. We're also seeing supply come on the market from the earliest baby boomers starting to pass away. So there's, and, and our population of 20 to 64 year olds is growing slower than it has in the past. So we can only get to the need for 1.4 million from a shelter standpoint. However, I think there's some upside to that. <clears throat> One, well, for, first of all, new homes have historically taken 15% of market share. It's not just about how much shelter do we need. It's also about, hey, there's six million sales every year, and if I can convince John Burns to buy a new home rather than a resale home, we can grow our share of the pie. So a lot of this is about having the right product in the right location. So 15% is the norm. We're only at 11 right now, and that's what we're spending a lot of time with our clients on, helping them gain back some market share, and they are. First of all, the more growth in the southern markets means that we need more homes built in the south, and some of the, we probably actually need fewer homes built in some of the northern markets and more homes built in the south. That can push the numbers up. There's this new category called building brand new homes for rent, intended to be rent, that has basically never been done before, about 45,000 homes per year. I think that is going to explode. In fact, I know it's going to explode because we're doing a lot of work for guys who are buying land and building it. And then the third opportunity, as I mentioned, is stealing resale market share. So let's talk about each of those three opportunities. To the extent you can, you're doing things geographically, and I know the answer is the smile states where 42% of America lives from Nevada through Texas to Florida up in the southeast, but 62% of the growth has been going there. I think that number is pushing up closer to 70 right now. The migration data is terrible, so one of the fun things we do is, well, it's not that fun for the person who does it, but it's fun for me who gets to analyze it, um, is we go to U-Haul's website and price out renting a 20-foot truck from one city to another and taking the same truck back. And if demand and supply are imbalanced, it should cost about the same, right? So taking a truck from New York to Orlando costs you $2,800, taking it back $723. Four to one ratio. From DC to Nashville, 1,400 bucks. 578 to take it back. From Chicago to Phoenix, 2258, half price to take it back. Uh, then it gets worse when you go to California. To Seattle, $2,300, it's not that far. <laughs> uh, 750 to bring it back. To Vegas, 1877 and $153 to bring it back. <laughs> Now, someone actually told me that if you're actually going to do this, you're going to drive it to Vegas and then drive it back and then fly. It would be, it would be cheaper. Uh, so the, the migration is heading south. Opportunity number two is um, these companies, which did not exist in 2011, and these are big companies. They now own 165,000 single-family rental homes, just these four. Uh, and they've proven that you can build a model of profitable single family rental home ownership. All four of these are publicly traded. You can look up their, their income statements. 12.8 million renters, 29% of all the renters in the United States rent a single family home. So let's look at the rental population. 14.7 million live in apartments of 10 units or more, and I know a lot of you are very focused on that business. The single family rental occupants are almost as large as all the occupants in all the large apartment complexes in the country. You go to the smaller apartment complexes, you get another 13.2 million people. Uh, there's condo rentals, about 2.9 million, and this is that big single family detached rental supply. And these are people who just are, I would rather rent a structure like that because I have a kids, I have pets, I'm a, you know, I have my toys, I can't do that in an apartment. We've been building 500,000 homes per year for this group and 45,000 homes per year for this group. Do you think the math can change and we can take that number to 150,000 a year pretty easily? I, I do, and we're in the very early stages of that happening. It is going to be a shift in the materials because I'm learning what goes into a rental home. The landlords want something different than what goes into a, an owned home. You can get that anytime. 
Um, so I think there's at least 50,000 uh, annual construction upside. These are the fastest growing home builders in America, and I'm willing to bet you never heard of most of them. The, the, these are the big companies that are building homes for rent. Redwood here has already built 90 subdivisions of single family rental homes. And I call them single family, but some of them are, are attached. So let me show you some of the products here. This is one by Christopher Todd, who just partnered with Taylor Morrison to have, so the, so the big builders now are building this for these guys, because these guys really don't know how to build homes as well as they do. 700 square foot cottage in Arizona, pulling the person out of an apartment complex who doesn't really want to be in an apartment complex and can say, you know what, now I got a little yard for my dog and I got a place for a barbecue and the rent is about the same. This top one is, uh, in Tennessee, we're seeing a lot of this. This seems to be the model that's working the most right now is two to seven unit townhome um, complexes. Redwood, Redwood has a, a two unit townhome complex. So it's a little, the, the data is a little wonky. I call them detached, but they're really attached, but they, they look pretty similar to homes. And then the third model, which we've actually seen less of this, but we're expecting to see more, is just your standard single family detached homes. The landlords are learning th simple things like, the, landlord, I mean, the renter will not pay me an extra dollar for a fireplace, so I don't want a fireplace in the house. The main pain for me is obviously tenant damage and turnover when the tenant leaves, so I want, uh, I want to know carpets, for example, and I want, I want materials and, and paints that are easy to, to paint over and, and wash up. So opportunity number three, which is stealing the market share, is really going after younger and older households. It's a barbell in demand here. Over the 10, year, over the 10 years, we're going to see 3.3 million households under the age of 45, and that's a little bit debatable based on economic growth, but it is going to grow. This is not debatable because this is the people who are currently in America just aging into place. We're going to see no growth in the 45 to 64-year-olds. Um, and all the growth, people aging into over 65. So that's, that's the real opportunity. And the home builders, I know they're tough negotiators and they'll whine all the time. Excuse to, there's a couple of them here in the audience, so except for you guys. <laughs> uh, these are the top six. Look at their growth in revenue over the last eight years. $68 billion, $6.3 billion in pre-tax net income, and they've been using their cash flow to pay down their debt. That's what I mean. They're totally recession ready. If Lehman Brothers happened this afternoon, these guys are far better capitalized to get through it than ever before. They've been running themselves very conservatively. However, we, one of the, also the, the things one of my team members do is they go to 800 home builder websites every quarter and count the number of actively selling communities they've got. So we know that really helps us with our short-term forecast on, on our forecast on permits because we know how many communities these guys are opening. They've only got 2% more communities than they did a year ago. And the, probably the most underappreciated supply issue in the industry is how difficult the land entitlement and land development business has gotten to the point where the guys have been doing it are just saying, especially 10 years into an economic recovery, the reward is not worth the risk. So we're, we're not seeing a lot of money go into the raw material that matters, which is a finished lot that I can build on, and so you're only seeing 2% community count growth. And that's why I can tell you with a lot of confidence, I don't see a hockey stick recovery. So if a recession hits, and that's the question I get asked a lot, um, I think it would look a lot like the 2001 recession. Um, the national data doesn't show it, but the local data does. The SNL crisis crushed Texas in the late 80s and hit Boston in the late 80s and then crushed California and Florida in the early 90s. So it was the different timing, but they were both 75% destructions of construction volume, wiping out the trades, the exact same issues. And if you look at the decline that we had for the country, it mirrors what happened in Texas and what happened in Southern California. And the, 2000, the reason I say that is the 2001 recession happened 10 to 13 years after the SNL crisis, and we're sitting here 10 to, 13, 10 to 11 years after the, uh, the Great Recession. I think it would be a hiccup. This is the single family construction hiccup that happened in 2001. Now, the industry did get some help from Greenspan, who dropped the Fed funds rate from six and a half all the way down to one. So obviously, we wouldn't get that kind of a benefit. But I'm, I'm telling you, there's not a lot of reason for concern. Um, 
There's three, well, there's 11 sh major shifts that we're tracking, but three of them I think really impact uh, lumber demand, so I thought I would share those. And I'm obviously not the construction expert like you guys are, but I'm gonna share how I think the home builders are looking at this. Shift number one is more high density suburban living. We have more dual income college educated households than ever before. The days of I'll stay at home while you commute an hour so we can have a nice home and raise the kids are far diminished from where they used to be and the land is out in those outlying areas. So, and then what has surprised me the most is the cities are asking for this. The cities are saying, I want more homes per acre near my downtown. I want to revitalize it, what's happened in these urban areas. I'd like some of it to come to my suburbs. The consumers are wanting it because I, now I'm work, you know, I'm not spending all day on the road, even though I know traffic is, is bad, but the consumers are saying, I want this. And, you know, a couple is saying, we're not going to be 45 minutes away from where the kids are in school. We need to be close. So the demand has shifted in. My builder and developer clients are saying, I want it too, because one lesson learned during the last recession was I can always sell a home in a great location. Uh, I can't even get people to show up in an outlying area. And this has been a struggle for the building products of companies because <clears throat> when you really get into it, uh, there's a lot of different issues here. Um, window placement is a huge issue, Getting, allowing for privacy but also allowing for light. The efficiency of the house has to be extremely efficient. Uh, and this is the type of product that we're seeing. We have one, one subscription that uh, goes out and uh, photographs and analyzes the most innovative designs out there, but this is what we're seeing young singles buying now, row townhomes. And I, I should mention, you know, this is in Ontario, California. This is more a rural is the wrong term, but a distant suburb. This is 45 minutes north of Dallas in Plano where you're seeing this high quality, high density um, construction. And what is changing? Lot sizes are declining and home sizes are declining. Uh, the square footage is trending down. The, actually, the square footage per acre might be trending up because they're building more homes on the acre, just the size of each unit is declining. And that is going to continue, particularly as they pivot to more affordable. Shift number two, uh, more of the home's gonna be built offsite. I don't need to preach that here, I, but this is how I think, this is Katera's plant, this is how I think the industry is looking at it. So there's gonna be some low cost solutions that will serve the demand for homeless uh, and accessory dwelling units. This is a home that was permitted in Austin, Texas and built in 24 hours with a um, 3D printer using concrete and $10,000 in materials. Uh, people go, oh, I don't wanna live in something like that. That's why I'm calling it more affordable. But D.R. Horton put some money into this company called Icon and is building a printer that will do a 2,000 square foot house. So stay tuned on that one. Modular solutions. Uh, this particular product uh, was built by Rad Urban in Oakland, California. My client uh, was the developer on this. They sold this for $700,000 an apartment unit and ordered three more. Obviously, uh, these, these similar sized units, this is where I'm going to see modular. Uh, and then panelized solutions, and the builders are looking more at this. It's uh, an on site, uh, replacing on site framers. A higher quality, this is RCI down in Orlando who already has the major market share. He pours the slab and builds the home in a day or two. Uh, and then you all know Jerry McCaughey, he spoke, spoke here last year, I believe. Uh, this is the technology he brought from Ireland to get it framed in a day. The builders are telling me, I will adopt all of these things. And I know you don't necessarily believe this because they're tough to negotiate with, but once you can prove to me it works, and it's not just cheaper on a price per square foot basis, but saves me time and is the right thing for doing my business, I, I am gonna move to this. The builders use subcontractors. They don't really care how the home gets built, honestly. It just has to make money. And then shift number three is uh, a return to the way things used to be. When my grandparents migrated here from Ireland, they stayed in a uh, boarding house. Uh, house sharing has returned as an affordable housing solution satisfying some housing demand. And baby boomers, and I'm one of them too, don't really understand how different they were. 
Every generation before the baby boomers uh, lived with their parents until they got married or, or had to move away. The only difference now is that people are getting married and moving away later in life. You go around the rest of the world, people live multi-generationally. Uh, we're going back to this. Either they're the only generation that m moved up every four or five years because I needed a bigger, better home. Hey, that's an expensive decision. We're going back to the way it used to be. Trends start small. If I had stood up here 10 years ago and said, you know what, I think this company is going to emerge that's going to allow you to stay in a stranger's house, you would have said, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Uh, their revenue now exceeds Marriott's. You've got couch surfing. That is, what is, going, that is how you find an affordable place to stay in places like San Francisco, New York, and LA right now. There's a, multiple new companies that have emerged. Uh, one's called PadSplit, where they're buying homes and remodeling the home, really, so eight people can live in the home independently, kind of like a little dorm situation. And the builders have been doing this, too. Lennar has a brand called NextGen. Pulte is doing this. Multi-generational living with a, with a separate entry. It might be for an adult kid. It might be for a grandparent. I'm finding more and more people are actually doing it because I need the rental income to help me with the mortgage. Uh, the, the issue is actually getting the city to approve it. And then there are 44 million homeowners who have empty bedrooms in their house. Why are they renting it out on Airbnb to a different person every week when they can pick a tenant that they actually get along with uh, and get an extra $10,000 a year in rental income? 24% of these are owned by the people over the age of 65. How many people over the age of 65 are going to need a little more rental income in retirement? I mean, th this is disrupting housing demand. You're starting to see new product like this, this urban co-living. It's more like a, a, a student housing type situation. This is what it looks like on the left, but you can find it on the right in a lot of cities in America. We Work has a division called We Live that's like, if you've been inside of We Work, it's pretty similar. It's you got your own, your own bedroom, but shared space with everybody else. And interestingly, this product is not that much more affordable. It's just cooler. Um, so the most likely case as we see it, this is construction, single family in the bottom, multifamily in the green there, and then manufactured, which a lot of people tend to leave out of the equation. Um, the most likely re uh, case for me is if we do have a recession and we're modeling a small one here, we're, we're looking at a dip for the next couple of years, but that is a minor dip. Uh, and then back at a million and a half by 2025. So that's what we're seeing is the most likely scenario. So hopefully these four conclusions, I, I just supported them. Good today, great over the short term, slow growth, um, and long-term upside. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to introduce Margaret. Thank you.